taxi cabs. They've always been an integral part of New York culture. Hey! I'm walking here! I'm walking here! I love them, and they love me. Hey, limp dick! Move! Hey, come on, let's go! What the f***? He's got someone in the back who's special! But now this New York icon is under threat. And who's to blame? Well, I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with goober. Business started going down was the day Uber came to town. But it's not just Uber. It's Lyft. It's Get. It's Juno. Via, Juno. Via. Yeah, I would say the business is down about 50%, yeah, at least. But, sorry, I, I can't hear you because there, there are no shock absorbers in this vehicle. You have potholes up and down the street here. I can't hear a thing you're saying because of the potholes. In order for cab drivers to operate on these streets, they need to make an investment in something called a medallion, which until recently had significant value. Owning a medallion was like having a seat on the stock exchange. It was something that you would pass on to your children. At this rate, taxis could become extinct. So John was turning to a higher power. I got a priest in the Lower East Side, and at least once a day I go by and he gives me a blessing and he's praying that the price of the medallion is gonna go up. Hey, Father Pat, let's go. There's a medallion, if you can bless it. Me, me, you can bless me, you can bless me. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Ooh. amen. Ooh. Ooh, it burns, it burns. Things have to be pretty bad when you resort to having a priest pray for your taxi. But the introduction of car apps like Uber forced the value of the medallion to go down 88% in just four years. It's possible that cabs may have added to this decline. I mean, people have had totally valid concerns about cabs for years. Uber, on the other hand, despite some negative press, is super quick and efficient. And it's not just passengers who are switching. Drivers are switching Hi. too. What's your name again? You can call me Easy. Oh, that was my nickname in high school. Oh, that's great. So you are Easy too. That's what they say. Easy was a cab driver for nine years before he became an Uber driver. I went to Uber because I want to be safe. You have Laffy Taffies? Not to be in dangerous. The, the good thing about Uber, too, is that... Are you, you going to finish all the candy? What? Give some for the other clients. Come on. That's mean. You will never get a good rating. You know what I love about Ubers? What? No glass. Oh, OK. What? Can you please sit back, please? Yes, please. I couldn't even steer please. from back here. Oh my God. There's Can no you don't touch my stuff? Please don't touch my stuff. Can you please sit back? Can you please? I got it. I did it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Just be quiet for a little bit, please. You know? Dizzy. <laughs> oh my God. Sorry. Uh, there is, a, there is a wipes, a wipes in the back for the disease and, uh, you know? That's what? it, that's it. Can you leave the car? Take your coffee and go. Thank you. That's I'm it, not. I'm done. No, 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 no. No, you are not taking my candy. You are not taking my candy. Come here. Give me the candy. Uber is oh, not what it's cracked me. up to be. It's like you borrow candy from one driver and suddenly your rating is unredeemable. That's what's great about taxis. There's no rating system. We always verbally rated each other. I can go to you, go f yourself and I feel good, and you feel good, and we're all on our way. Well, I thought it was a New Yorker's way of saying, have a nice day. That's because they didn't like you as a passenger. And I am it. perfectly pleasant. I am a perfectly pleasant passenger. I'm easy to be around. I'm polite. I'm white. What more do you want from me? Listen, in a yellow cab, you can break balls and not get rated. What's better than that? What is better than that? I can't imagine a cabless world without guys like John in the front seat. I mean, after all, he's more than a cabbie. He's my friend. Thanks, John. Hey. Go f yourself. You too. Hi, I'm Michael Costa. You know, all my life, I've loved nunchucks. But up until this year, I could have been arrested for even carrying my chucks down the streets of New York City. I sat down with the hero who changed that law. And you? You can thank me later. Ow!
I'm Jim Maloney. I'm the lawyer who recently was able to get the nunchuck prohibition in New York overturned on constitutional grounds. You made nunchucks legal in New York. Well, actually, it's pronounced nunchucks. Right, nunchucks. Why are you so obsessed with nunchucks? They were a big part of my life for many years. So, yeah, I'm passionate about my right to have them. How did this all start? Um, shortly after the martial arts movies featuring Bruce Lee became real popular. A lot of kids, including myself, uh, started playing around with nunchucks, and uh, the legislature got fearful that they were going to be used by gangs to terrorize people, you know, mugging them. And so the legislature just decided to ban them completely. The law went into effect September 1st, 1974. In the years since then, there have been sporadic prosecutions um, against people who have them in their home. I had a similar experience. Uh, police searched my home. They found nunchucks under the couch. Police found nunchucks under your couch. Nunchucks. Nunchucks, got it. Uh, based on that, I was charged with possession of chucka sticks, as they're called under the uh, statute. So as soon as the criminal case as was As James involved, droned on about his decades-long legal battle, I thought of a much more exciting way to tell his kung fu story. <laughs> Less than a month, I brought this constitutional challenge. Hey, isn't it a little weird that I'm playing this guy? He's like super white. Ronnie, if a white guy does it, it's problematic. It's cultural appropriation. If you do it, it's fine. Is it? I, I honestly, I don't know. Okay, whatever. Let's fight. I have to serve them with uh, summons and complaint. And in 2007, my Second Amendment claim was not really established yet as applying against the states. So it was dismissed, and I had to appeal the dismissal. But the Second Amendment, that's about guns. Well, the Second Amendment says... I understand the Second Amendment. I'm an expert, to be honest with you. Go ahead, tell us about the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state... Free state, right. The right of the people to keep and bear Arms shall not be infringed, not firearms. And nunchucks falls under that? It does. So this became a Second Amendment issue. Right. I appeal to the Second Circuit, Court of Appeals. I have three judges on the panel, Judge Pooler, Judge Katzman, and Judge Sotomayor. Sotomayor, Supreme Court Justice today. Correct. That's right, Sotomayor even mentioned Jim in her Senate confirmation hearing. Sir. Um, in Maloney, we were talking about nunchuck sticks. Told you it was nunchucks. <laughs> they um, did not give me the relief I asked for on the basis that the Second Amendment did not guarantee that right as against state laws. <laughs> and said, if you want that, you have to go to the Supreme Court. And that is where I was feeling down and out. Where are your nunchucks in all of this? I basically unstrung the nunchucks. I cut the cord. You took Whoa. your sacred nunchucks <laughs> and you cut them. No big deal. You just put them back together when you're ready. <sighs> what the Supreme Court did um, was toss out the decision that killed the case and send it back down. So then I was back down in the trenches again. You're alive, baby. Oh, I... <laughs> right? Anyway, sure. so um, I'm back down in the trenches, and uh, I get a new judge, and she wanted me to show expert testimony and statistics, and so I, I flew in a couple of people who were knowledgeable about nunchucks. You flew in nunchuck experts, both white guys, I presume? They are. Yep. It was kind of a funny trial because I was wearing a lot of hats. I was the plaintiff, obviously. I'm the lawyer. And I was also the first witness. I said, Your Honor, I'll now call my first witness, which is myself. It was three days of trial. And on December 14th, the judge struck down the entire statute. And did you feel like, oh my god, this is over? I get to just nunchuck the shit out of everything now. <laughs> Everybody in New York is nunchucking. Kids, pets, adults, grandparents, nannies. Because of you. Did you receive an award from the Nunchuck Association or from chuckers all around the world? No. What'd you get? The decision. 
I figured you'd say something like that. I'm presenting you with a nunchuck award. Read it out loud, what does it say? To James Maloney for striking down the ban on nunchucks yep. from your chuck buddy, Michael Costa. I also made this commemorative shirt. On the front it says I live for three things, and on the back it says suckin', <laughs> and chuckin'. Given the state of the Republican Party right now, you might think that the person they're replacing Liz Cheney with would be a 180-proof Trumpist from the heart of mega country. But actually, for most of her political career, Elise Stefanik was the exact opposite. Elise Stefanik was not always considered a Trump Republican. Stefanik was seen as a moderate when, in 2014, she won a House race in upstate New York at age 30. She was the youngest woman ever elected to Congress when she first won uh, this office. And at that time, she was a pretty classic East Coast moderate conservative. In 2015, 2016, and the early days of the Trump administration, Stefanik repeatedly and publicly opposed Trump. Opposing him on NAFTA and trade, even voting against his signature 2017 tax cuts. She also criticized Trump's initiative to build a wall, saying, quote, I don't think that's realistic. In 2015, Stefanik also disagreed with Trump's calls for a Muslim ban, saying, this is not who we are as a country. And Stefanik wrote this after the release of the Access Hollywood tape. Donald Trump's inappropriate offensive comments are just wrong. Uh, I've disagreed with the president's rhetoric uh, numerous times when it comes to how he addresses women. So Elise Stefanik didn't like Trump's tax cuts, didn't like his trade deals, didn't like his Muslim ban, didn't like his sexism, didn't even like his wall. She basically didn't like anything about Trump, which is insane. I mean, you expect that from Trump's wife, but not a Republican congresswoman. So for a while, Stefanik was pretty much what used to be called a normal Republican. And then in late 2019, she saw an opportunity to make like Billie Eilish and give herself an eye-catching new image. Elise Stefanik became the breakout star of the House hearings for Trump's first impeachment often tangling with Democrats. To have our Democratic colleagues say these untruthful statements just reeks of political desperation in their continued obsession to manipulate mainstream media coverage. Trump was so impressed at the time, he tweeted, a new Republican star is born. After Trump lost and started pushing the big lie, Elise Stefanik signed on, fighting to overturn the 2020 electoral results in both Pennsylvania and Texas. As this newly minted version of Stefanik moved ever closer to Trump's orbit, her fundraising exploded and so did her profile. Stefanik became a regular on Fox News and her cheerleading for Team Trump moved into hyperdrive. Stefanik was clearly on Trump's radar, even if he couldn't pronounce her name. Elise Stefanik. Look, you can't take offense to that. Trump pronounces words like a great jazz musician. You'll never hear it the same way twice, twice. Now, to outsiders, this might have seemed like Stefanik suddenly embracing the dark side, you know, like Anakin turning into Darth Vader, except for the part about wearing a mask. But the truth is, she probably just made a straightforward calculation. She saw where the party was going, and she decided to go along with it. You know, it's just a little awkward to start rooting for someone after they've been publicly disgraced. I never really liked R. Kelly's music, but now that I've heard the charges against him, it's kind of dope. It's the rim, Mr. Ignition, put the fish out of the kitchen. I mean, like, are you guys hearing this? And once Stefanik hopped on the Trump train, she never looked back. In fact, these days, it can sometimes be hard to tell her and Trump apart. Democrats are obsessed with impeachment. They have been obsessed with impeachment. The phony Russia hoax. The phony Russia hoax of Russia collusion. We need election integrity and election reform immediately. We want to be able to fix and strengthen our election security and election integrity. Sleepy Joe rejects the scientific approach in favor of locking all Americans in their basements for months on end. Joe Biden wants to keep them locked up in the basement. Damn. This goes way beyond just agreeing with Trump. It actually sounds like she's preparing to play Trump in a movie. I must become Trump. This is my process. So, in the end, Elise Stefanik surrendered her principles, 
her dignity, and even her voice to Donald Trump. And what did that get her? Enormous amounts of cash, the support of a passionate base of voters, the inside track to a powerful position in party leadership? Yes, yes, it gave her all those things. But was it worth it? Because it seems like it was kind of worth it. I mean, God damn. If you're one of those people who looks at their phone while walking down the street, then congratulations, you are a human being. (laughs) Because that's just what people do. Only now, if you do it, you might also be a criminal. New York state lawmakers will consider making it illegal for pedestrians to text or even look at their phones while crossing the street. Fines under a new bill would range from 25 bucks to $250 for repeat offenders. Exceptions would be made for emergencies. Fines for looking at your phone when you cross the street. This is such a first world problem. (laughs) No, not because we don't have smartphones in other countries. It's just because we know our drivers don't give a shit about people crossing the street. (laughs) You see, where I come from, if you look at your phone, you get hit by a car. That's the fine. That's it. (laughs) Honestly, that's what they should do. New York shouldn't outlaw texting. They should just say it's legal to run people over. (laughs) I guarantee you now, no one will be looking at their phone. (laughs) until they safely at home. Yeah, even then, they'll check to just make sure the door is locked. Otherwise, you might go watch TV. All of a sudden, there's a Honda Civic in your living room. Ah! Ah! (laughs) So, how do New Yorkers feel about this new law? Well, the folks over at Fox & Friends, they wanted to find out, so they sent a man named Steve Ducey to find out. We've been watching all sorts of people walking by with their texting device. Excuse me, ma'am. Hello, hello. Excuse me? Going forward, you could get fined $250. Is that a bad idea or a I, good idea? I really don't want it. Okay. I don't think she has... She's in a hurry to go to work. Okay, this guy right over here. Hi, how are you? Look at this guy right here. See, he's using his uh, phone through... Hi, excuse me, can I ask a question? Can you tell that New York City is a very busy place? Here's a guy. I'm going to surprise him. I'm going to see if I can get his attention. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Hi. Excuse me? Can I ask you a question? Hmm. Oh, man. Oh, man. You realize that last guy was literally about to step into the traffic rather than talk to Steve Ducey. He was like, ah, taxi, Fox News, taxi, Fox News. I'll take a chance with the taxi. So, yes. It soon might be against the law to look at your phone in New York City while crossing the street. Unless, unless it's an emergency. That's what they said. Which made us wonder, how do you decide which counts as an emergency and which doesn't? Well, Ronnie Chang went to find out. Hi, I'm here to find out what the big emergency is for all these people who are walking and texting. Like this person. What's the big emergency? There's none. Excuse me, sir, why are you walking and texting at the same time? What is the emergency? Is that an emergency text? Let me see your text. Let me see that text. Let me see it. Come on. What's the emergency, man? Why are you walking and texting? What's the big emergency? Excuse me, miss. Excuse me, miss. You can only text and walk at the same time Um, if it's an emergency. Is that an emergency right now? Yeah. What's the emergency? I was telling my boyfriend about these shoes I saw. This is the dumbest shit I've ever seen in my life. What's this? He sent you a dick pic? Yo, you call that a dick pic? Let me me show you a dick pic. No, you can't. Excuse me, miss, what is the emergency that you are texting? I'm talking about Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones? Yes. Game of Thrones? Yes. Okay, to be fair, that is kind of an emergency. Carry on, carry on. Yeah. Walking and Instagramming. You're looking at all the ass on Instagram. You're missing all the ass in real life. Just look up once in a while. Yeah. Okay, that is a whole new level. (laughs) That's actually probably okay. Way to find a loophole, bro. Who are you texting? Let me see, let me see the texting. Who's Dominic? He didn't reply to you. He just ghosted you. Let me reply. Let me reply to them. Let me reply to them. Let me reply to them. You up? Want to Netflix and chill in my ass? Wait. No. He needs to know. He needs to know. Staten Island, a place famous for mob wives, spray tans, and cheese sticks. But there's more to the wildlife here than just beefed up sleeve haters. So I met up with park ranger Sarah O'Quinn to find out more. There actually are a lot of wild animals here. We have a big population of deer actually in Staten Island. You may have heard of deer when they went viral last August or from that popular Snapchat filter. Adorable, right? Wrong. You know, in this case, 
there, there can be too much of a, of a good thing. The deer population can grow larger than the environment can support it, and that's something we definitely want to control. In six years, Staten Island went from 24 deer to nearly 1,000, leading to Lyme disease, property damage, and the destruction of several souped-up Nissan Maximas. All right, so how are we going to take care of this, Kentucky style? No, we're not, we're not going to Chicago style. No, no Texas style. We're not taking any lethal action. We're going to be performing vasectomies. Sure, that's the, yeah, that's the obvious solution to the problem. That would be the first thing that one would think of. Well, honestly, it is, it is a little bit outside of the box. Way outside the box. And this raises one pressing question. Woman to woman, when you cut their dicks off, does it feel good? Actually, I have to correct you, we're not castrating them. And in fact, we're not gonna do it. We're hiring a contractor who has expertise in this area, Tony DiNicola. Oh, so you got a guy, Tony. I, I got, got a guy, guy Tony. Tony. Is it check and loan, Tony? No. Free gas for handies, Tony. Not the same Tony. Thirsty Thursdays, karaoke night, Tony. This is not the same Tony. Different Tony. So I met up with Dick Slayer Tony, Tony DiNicola. Did you always know that you wanted to neuter deer, or did you lose a bet? Uh, no, it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, yeah. Tony's plan involved cameras, tracking, and yes, I knew it, a gun. Is it pretty precise when you shoot their dicks off? Um, we're not that good. Ugh, turns out they're gonna tranquilize them and give them operations. There's just one problem. This idea is nuts. Meet deer expert Al Cambrone. For this to work, we need to capture nearly all those bucks, and if only, say, 20% remain, then we'll still have lots of fawns next spring. So they're gonna still... Yeah, and one buck can happily breed many does. Well, Staten Island. Yeah. Another problem is that deer can swim. Bucks are going to be coming from New Jersey. Bridge and tunnel deer are the worst. And we'll be right back where we started. And it gets worse. This is gonna cost $2 million. That's like over 5,000 a dick. Relative to the costs of not doing anything, we think it's a really wise investment. One more problem with the vasectomy plan. Oh, Jesus. Every fall, there's deer mating season, what we call the rut. Those that don't become pregnant, they'll be back in the heat. Things get wild out there. Like a two month frenzy. Exactly. More like summer Bible camp. Yeah. Time to come up with a more realistic solution. Have you thought about introducing Japanese deer sex dolls? Well, that's a possibility. Worked for my husband. Hmm. Won't even look at me now. Nothing. There are, during the rut, it's interested like just had a baby in only one and thing. Your body changes and biologically things are a little bit different and when you nurse, Things happen in your body, and you don't even want to know what happens down there after having it. It's like sometimes a woman just needs attention. Sure, Al was a great listener, but he had no solutions. But you know who might? Good old-fashioned, salt-of-the-earth Staten Islanders. Take down those <laughs> with a baseball bat. Bring them back to Jersey. Do you have a guy? I know a couple of guys, but no guys that move deals. We should get some in mountain lions over here. This plane is going to cost $2 million. $2 million? Give me and Rob a million, we'll take care we'll of it. We'll take care of it ourselves. <laughs> every deer on Staten Island, I'll wait in a tree stand every night, I'll get every deer. I'll put them right in the headlock. Guaranteed. With my arms. You look like Christina Aguilera. Are you her? No, I'm not Christina Aguilera. Okay. I got a few solutions. What are they? Me and you. Jump my car, go back to my place. That's when I realized we had the perfect solution this whole time just for a different Staten Island problem. Finally, time to cut some dicks off. When you think of the Hamptons, you think of pristine beaches, cold rosé, and dressing up as a caterer to sneak into Billy Joel's Labor Day party. But the Hamptons also have a dark side, an ancient conflict between the white man and his mansions and the Shinnecock, a native tribe who live next door on their ancestral lands. Now, the conflict is erupting again as the Shinnecock have erected a giant tribal monument on the only road into the Hamptons. 
I went to find out how an indigenous symbol could raise tensions in a place with the world's highest concentration of NPR tote bags. It is kind of an eyesore. You know, you come here for its beautiful nature and environment, and to see that, it's just out of place. Uh, very obtrusive and distracting. Okay. Just it's so big. Right. There's so much to kind of cover from yeah. top to bottom. It's distracting, and so it could be potentially dangerous okay. for any of the drivers. Okay, it's potentially dangerous for drivers, but that's not the main objection. I believe that it doesn't allow you to maintain uh, the purity of an enclave here. When white people start talking about purity, even I get a little creeped out. But many of these Hamptonites really believe the monument infringes on their spiritual connection to the land. To get the tribe's perspective, I met with Chairman Brian Polite. And no, I'm not gonna make fun of his name. That would be rude. Brian, thank you for sitting down. I know you've had some bad experiences with the white man, but I come in peace. Hey man, we're all about peace. The people of Southampton are saying that due to your monument, their way of life is under attack. <laughs> You're laughing, okay. <laughs> That's just laughable. We're a sovereign nation, and they have no authority to tell us what we can and cannot do on our tribal land. What was the reaction within the tribe when the monument went up? Very happy. We're the forgotten people of the Hamptons. So now we have our marker on the gateway of the Hamptons reminding people that they're all visitors on our land. Clearly, the monument is a source of pride, but what is it? Could it be a totem, a rock carving, or an ancient burial mound? Would its powers reveal my spirit animal? I couldn't wait to experience this mysterious tribal monument for myself. Holy shit, it's a billboard. I've never seen anything so big. I mean, I have, but it's pretty big. So these natives are using capitalism to ruin the white man's sacred way of living with nature. Talk about cultural appropriation. This tribal monument looks a lot like an electronic billboard. If you ask anybody on the Shinnecock Nation, they'll say it's a monument. Let's call it what it is. This monument is your side hustle. You're making some extra money on the side. It's a monument to our overcoming adversity mm -hmm. and saying that we're still here. But also we need money for education, police department, playgrounds, social programs. So it'll have an immediate economic impact to the nation. How much of this monument is economics for the tribe and how much of it is kind of a you to the Hampton residents? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. Now you see, that's not very polite. Every time somebody builds a McMansion on our ancestors' bones or plays golf on our ancestors' bones, that's a big F you to us. So if we can feed our people and at the same time stick it to a town that stuck it to us for the last 375 years, so much the better. Okay. So, I just want you to know that no more golf for me. Thank you. In response to the monument, white people have been sharing an important part of their culture, lawsuits. Members of the tribe see these as part of a long pattern of oppression. Well, there's some restitution and reparations that have to be made, and this sign is, a, is pointing to it. The time is now. It's horrible, the way we've been treated since 1640. Yeah, I can go into town and I can mow your lawn and I can scrub your toilet and I can pretend like it's okay no more. Come to my reservation and see why this is so important to make a stand. As a white man, facing a 400-year legacy of injustice, racism, and poverty made me feel like a total piece of shit. But gazing across the bay at Calvin Klein's $75 million mega mansion, it hit me. Maybe I could be the guy in that Kevin Costner movie and bring a message of peace to the pale faces. And I knew the perfect way to reach them. Problem solved. New York City in the summertime. There's so much to love about this place. It's got 100% humidity, so you don't need to shower. <laughs> if you get too hot, you can always go to the beach and swim in a sea of syringes. <laughs> and love is in the air because of all the subway masturbators. But <laughs> just when I thought New York couldn't get any better, this happened. The blackout mystery, a major section of New York City grinding to a halt as 40 blocks go dark. Mass confusion in Manhattan, minutes after a power outage flipped the off switch on the city's bright lights. From above, you could see the shadows of the skyline. In Times Square, the usually vibrant billboards went black. That's right, one of America's largest cities was cast into darkness. Even Times Square went completely black. And I don't know if you've seen 
a dark Times Square, but it is terrifying. <laughs> I saw it, and I, I felt like at any second a face was gonna show up on the screens like, citizens of Earth, <laughs> prepare to be probed. <laughs> like, it was really, really creepy. <laughs> now, for me, this blackout was double terrifying, okay? Because for the 4th of July, I went to California. And then while I was there, an earthquake hit, okay? And then I was like, well, that was scary. Then a few days later, another earthquake hit. And if like one earthquake is bad enough, the second one feels like it's trying to finish you off, yeah? <laughs> I was just shaking like, I'm sorry, Mother Earth, I'll recycle more. <laughs> so after that, I was like, you know what? I can't do this, I can't, like, I can't do earthquakes. I'm flying back to New York, and then the blackout hit. <laughs> At that point, I was like, yeah, Trump must tell me to come, go back to where I came from. I'll leave, I'm fine, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready, I'll go. And the worst part, the worst part was when the power went out. Mayor Bill de Blasio wasn't here because he was off in Iowa campaigning to be president, which is a shame because we could have used him in New York, not as mayor, but just as like a lighthouse, just to (laughs) help us see everything. (laughs) And you know what's great about New York? Is even though the mayor wasn't there, everyday New York has stepped up to do their part. After the sunset this evening, Manhattan's west side was just about pitch black. People and pets kept their flashlights close. Businesses and apartments were in the dark. Some delis and restaurants were trying to serve customers with flashlights. And Hell's Kitchen residents passed the time on their stoops, too hot to be in their apartments without AC. Stoplights at some busy intersections off, leaving pedestrians to step in to direct traffic. Yeah, you see? (laughs) That's what New Yorkers do, baby. They helped out during a crisis. Huh? (laughs) Basically, New Yorkers were doing every policeman's job. They were directing traffic. They were checking in on old people. It was inspiring. Except for the one person who probably tried to take over a hostage negotiation. (laughs) He was like, don't worry, everybody, I got this. All right, tough guy, shoot one of them to know you're serious. Come on, let's see. (laughs) And it wasn't just the pedestrians stepping up. No, even Broadway actors made the best out of the blackout. How do you handle things when the lights go out on Broadway? Well, the cast of several musicals took their act to the streets during Saturday Night's Blackout here in Manhattan. See, you gotta love Broadway, man, huh? You gotta love Broadway. The show must go on. Think about, that's real talent. Because the power also went out at the movie theaters, huh, at AMC, Yeah, but you didn't see John Wick come out of the screen and kick people's asses in real life. No. But even a blackout couldn't stop Broadway. Everyone came out. The singers carried on their musicals on the sidewalk. The thespians thespianed outside, huh? And the cast of The Lion King brought their performance to life in the streets by mauling seven people to death. It was really inspiring. Plus, I will say we all got a new life hack, all of us people who live in New York uh, and people who visit. uh, If you can't afford tickets to a show like Hamilton, just cut the power, you get a show for free. Yeah. (laughs) Everyone just comes outside. Now, everywhere's the room where it happens. And thankfully, after three hours, the power came back on. But even though no one was hurt, this blackout might be a sign of something a lot more ominous. While investigators don't believe foul play was involved in Saturday, national security experts say the blackout should serve as a wake-up call. National security experts are very concerned that this country's power grid is vulnerable to a cyber attack. Complex systems that have been put in place and built upon over many years, there are going to be vulnerabilities. Our adversaries know what those vulnerabilities are and they will look to exploit them. That's right, this is another reminder that America's power grid is vulnerable. And we don't know if that's what caused this blackout, but it is a little suspicious that it was on the anniversary of the 1977 major blackout. Like maybe this was just a coincidence, a malfunction, or maybe a hostile foreign power was trying to hack America. We'll never know. Yeah. And if they've done it once, they can do it again and again. So Russia, if you're listening, (laughs) I'll be outside Hamilton next Thursday. (laughs) You guys know what to do. You know, the, the biggest issue I think I have and many other people have with Mike Bloomberg and how he's defending his stop and frisk record is that he doesn't seem to know what he's defending. And that, that for me is a problem, you know? He goes, oh, I, I apologize for the policy. And people are not, are not as angry about the policy, I think, as how the policy was targeted. Because for so many years, 
especially in America, black people have said, hey, the police are targeting us just because we're black. They treat us like we're all criminals. They're not just trying to go for criminals. And what would people say to people? Oh, you're overreacting. Cops are not just gonna throw you against the wall. You must have done something. You and I can imagine for a long time, for many black Americans, it must have felt like being gaslit. You know what's happening to you. You say what's happening to you and people are like, that's crazy. And I can imagine how for many white people in America, they're like, that is crazy. You just got thrown against the wall? Why? You must have been doing something. Because white people are like, I've never been thrown against the wall. That, that would never happen to me. What, what? You just got thrown against the wall? That's it? I see cops all the time. I say, hello, officer. They say, hello, sir. And then I keep walking. <laughs> you just got thrown against the wall? That doesn't make any sense. And, I can ima- and then a lot of black people were like, you white people are being racist because you don't. And white people are like, that is insane. Cops will not just throw. And I can see how people have lived in these worlds for so long. And then now you have audio of Mike Bloomberg saying, and that audio for me, if you break it down into pieces, has so many issues with it. First of all, the fact that he says, if you look at criminals and, 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 and victims of crime, et cetera, you can Xerox. You can just copy and paste it and put it out there. It shows me that you didn't even care about the differences between black people. You made it seem like black is crime when in fact black is most affected by crime. That is the thing that you did there, right? That's the first problem I have. Secondly, the fact that people don't seem to realize the ramifications of treating people like that. Imagine if you are a black kid living in Mike Bloomberg's New York City. Every day, you're getting frisked and thrown against a wall, huh? put over the hood of a car every day. This is what cops are just, this is your life. Now imagine if you are a black kid who lives in this world. A cop gets you, pulls you, throws you into a wall. You got something, you, no, you carry, next day it happens again. Maybe next week, maybe next month, whenever it is. At some point, what do you say? Fuck the police, yeah? And then you get people like, why don't you respect the police? Why don't they respect me? They don't protect and serve me. These people come and throw me against the wall and treat me like a criminal. You know what I mean? And then what does that kid do one day? They see the cops, they go, screw this. I'm not staying around for this. They run away. The cops pursue. Now they catch you. What are you? You're you're evading arrest. You're resisting arrest. Now you get arrested for resisting arrest. Then you go to jail. You can't afford bail. Now you're in prison. What does prison turn you into more likely than not? A criminal. Right? And even if you don't become a criminal because of that, you are still in the system now. We've seen how these kids get locked up, they can't afford to come out. Now they are living a life of crime without being a criminal. And then you're just like, oh, but these kids spend all their time in jail. How did they get to jail? Why were you running from the cops? Because I was tired of being thrown against the motherfucking wall. <laughs> I'm not gonna stick around for that. I remember that in high school. I didn't wait, the bully came and I was like, oh shit, and I was gone. <laughs> I wasn't gonna stand there and be like, yeah, well, well, good afternoon, bully. Uh, Nice to see you again. Uh, Different thing today, yes? Are we gonna talk this out? No, at some point you knew the bully was gonna do what he's gonna do, so you ran before they even got to you. And then people are like, why are these kids running away? They don't respect the police, but do the police respect them? And that is something no one can deny. If you've ever been in a rich neighborhood specifically, not just a white neighborhood, but a rich neighborhood, you will see the relationship that police have with those communities, it's very different. Because they know if they throw the wrong person, search the wrong person, frisk the wrong person, that person knows someone powerful enough to make sure that their job is in danger. And those are the dynamics that you're dealing with here. And so my problem with Mike Bloomberg is, he's not saying, I'm sorry for targeting black people. I'm sorry for treating black people like second class citizens. I'm sorry for gaslighting black people for so long. No, he's just like, I'm sorry that stop and, stop and frisk happened to affect black communities. And it's like, no, it didn't happen to, you designed it to.